The best part about my job is that I subscribe to HBO Max in time to get that $12 a month rate for a year, and now I can write it off as a business expense. Anyway, let's talk about Euphoria. Trust me, readers, I can definitely understand why someone might be on the fence in watching season one of Euphoria. For a lot of people who are fans of her, it serves as one of Zendaya's first steps away from the family-friendly monikers of Disney, like other successful alums of the Disney Channel before her, and into a more mature Hollywood that can allow us to see her true range as an actress. And if you haven't seen Euphoria yet, then trust me when I say that she, 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 ha she has what it takes. But others might need a bit more convincing, and trust me, I get it. As someone who watched this first and foremost because they wanted to see how Zendaya stepped her game up, I wasn't necessarily immediately on board with a lot of the setup and themes the first couple of episodes told me I was in for. Exploring the lives and drama of a group of privileged 2019 Southern California suburban high school students didn't sound like anything that I was interested in, especially since not only has that part of my life been over for 14 years, but the culture difference is so present that I could find none of their experiences relatable. It's part of the reason why I never really gelled well with Ed, Ed and Eddie on Cartoon Network growing up. It wasn't because I didn't have any friends growing up, but the idea that all of my close friends being in such close proximity with each other instead of different neighborhoods scattered all across the city of Detroit was wishful thinking to the point where the show itself didn't reach out to me like it could have. Now, if you've been watching me for a while, you're probably calling me a hypocrite now regarding that point of relatability. And that's mostly because one of the things that I like to preach when it comes to stories and characters is that the lack of relatability in either characters or a scenario isn't necessarily a deal breaker for me. It's part of the reason why I don't entertain the opinion that Marvel superheroes are better than DC superheroes because Marvel heroes are more easily accessible due to their relatability. Like, of course you're not going to completely relate to Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman. They're a solar-powered alien, a multi-millionaire philanthropist, and a Greek demigoddess. So when I entered Euphoria, I did with the sole purpose of seeing how Zendaya was going to portray Rue. All I knew before then was that she was going to be portraying a 17-year-old drug addict, that she was more than likely going to be tempted along the way to recovery and eventually find love from what I've seen of the promos. Then the first episode takes such a deep dive into so many aspects about herself, her mental disorders, the loss of her father, how she initially got hooked on drugs. The time dedicated to the exposition of Rue's character, both in summaries and during the real time of the episode, was very wisely spent in order for us to get a better idea of her character. Then, as you watch her in the next couple of episodes, because you've been exposed to that knowledge in a way that didn't feel like an info dump and operates in a way that's similar to how Rue's head is hardwired, you start to emphasize with her. You want her to find love. You want her to get better. You either smile or let out a disappointed sigh whenever she makes decisions in favor of her getting better or see her relapse respectively. It's pretty much why episode three of season one is my favorite as far as how Rue's development is handled. I won't ruin it in case you decide to watch the season after this video, but I've never been so proud of a fictional character in my life after watching it. The kicker here is that this treatment isn't just exclusive to Rue. It's given to pretty much every other main cast member of the show. It's done in a way where, at first, they just look like a typical band of high school TV tropes and stereotypes. You got the outcast, the football jock antagonist, who is the textbook definition of lawful evil, by the way, the token black dude, the new kid, 
the main girl cheerleader girlfriend of the jock antagonist, the nerdy fat girl, and the best friend of the mean girl cheerleader with the fun mom. And you expect a lot of them to play out the same tropes, especially when the girls all hang out. Then you find out over the period of a few episodes that all the tropes that they're based on are actually subverted and that they're genuinely all friends with each other and both lift each other up and call each other out if need be. Then, once it becomes relevant to the season, they're given the rude treatment and we see their exposition. We see that in one way or another, they're just as flawed as Rue is. And just like Rue, the combination of us receiving those puzzle pieces and seeing how their tropes are subverted once we get a better understanding of their characters, we either root for them, wish to see their downfall, or just wish that they find happiness once we see how the overall story relates to their own arcs. The way that this show is formatted is a character writer's dream. <laughs> and when I mean character writer, I specifically mean writers who prefer the actions and decisions of the characters to drive the narrative of the story in a way that feels natural, as opposed to forcing said characters to stick to the overall plot. It's the difference between directly controlling a Sims character in order for them to reach a certain goal versus letting said sim character interact with the world on their own and hoping they'll eventually get there without setting themselves on fire. One is more direct and to the point as far as achieving said goals that leaves some wiggle room for development and whatnot, while the other will definitely take longer because of how much freedom you're allowing them by giving them permission to go at their own pace. These writers are respectively called plotters and pantsers. Plotters plot out the way they want everything to happen beforehand, while pantsers fly by the seat of their pants. Trust me, one of my good friends is a pantser, and every time she vents about the decisions her characters made as if she had no control over the situation, I'm all like, but they're your characters. You created them. You could have just had them do the thing. I, I don't understand. Why are you like this? Now, am I saying that Euphoria has no plot? Not necessarily. But from what season one has shown and what its finale has teased season two will be, it's the acts and decisions of Rue, Jules, and everyone else in the main cast that are gonna drive the story forward first and foremost. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. But I digress readers, your homework assignment for the day. If you've seen season one of Euphoria, write in the comment section below what you think of the series so far. Or if you feel like sharing with the rest of the class, whether or not you prefer a plotter style or a pantser style when it comes to reading, writing, or viewing stories. Whichever you decide to answer, I'd love to know your thoughts. If you want to help financially support the channel, you can join my Patreon by clicking the card at the end of the video or in the link in the description down below, where you can also find a link to my merchandise store. Or if you prefer to give a one-time donation, you can find links to my PayPal and my coffee account in the description box as well. Also, make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications because I post new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and every other Friday. But until then, this is Rita's 101. Class dismissed. <laughs>